Welcome to you all this morning, wherever you're watching this, uh, whether it is actually this morning or whether you're watching it later in the day or even later in the week. Whichever you are most welcome to join us as we all gather together from wherever it is we are to share in worship together of God. My name's Chef, for those who don't know me, I'm a local preacher in the Chelmsford Circuit and it's my pleasure this morning to uh, be able to lead this worship and to share with you. Um, so as we begin, let's pray together. Lord, as we come this morning, we pray for your presence. We know that you are always with us, but we pray that we will be especially aware of that now in this time. Enter into our hearts and our minds, that we may be filled with your hope and with your love, that we may know your presence really closely with us, and that we may bathe in your love. Help us to be open to what you have to say to us. Help us to be open to the prompting of your Holy Spirit. And help us once we have received all that you have to offer to be ready to go forward in your name to be ready to share in the expansion of your kingdom we know lord that all too often we're we're too scared perhaps or too worried or too embarrassed to do some of the things that we should do it's all too easy for us to stand and do nothing it's too easy for us to hide behind doors and walls and to feel comfort and to feel safe to do the things that don't cause us any challenge but that's not your way that's not what we're called to do you are a God who calls us to bring people to you who calls us to challenge injustice who calls up calls us to stand up for those who have no voice who calls us to set for prisoners free to bring healing to the sick to bring hope to the hopeless and at times that comes with a risk for us at times that comes as a challenge to us and so we pray that you give us your strength you give us your courage you fill us with your holy spirit that we may be able to go forth in your name and to do great things lord be with us now share in this time as we share with one another in faith and in fellowship amen
read to you from Acts chapter 8, and it's uh, the story of uh, the Ethiopian eunuch. And I'm going to read it from the message, just for a change. This is what it says. Later, God's angel spoke to Philip. At noon today, I want you to walk over to that desolate road that goes from Jerusalem down to Gaza. He got up and went. He met an Ethiopian eunuch coming down the road. The eunuch had been on a pilgrimage to Jerusalem and was returning to Ethiopia, where he was a minister in charge of all the finances of Candace, Queen of the Ethiopians. He was riding in a chariot and reading the prophet Isaiah. The spirit told Philip, climb into the chariot. Running up alongside, Philip heard the eunuch reading Isaiah and asked, do you understand what you're reading? He answered, how can I without some help? And invited Philip into the chariot with him. The passage he was reading was this. As a sheep led to the slaughter, and quiet as a lamb being sheared, he was silent, saying nothing. He was mocked and put down, never got a fair trial. But who now can count his kin, since he's been taken from the earth? The eunuch said, Tell me, who is the prophet talking about, himself or some other? Philip grabbed his chance. Using this passage as his text, he preached Jesus to him. As they continued down the road, they came to a stream of water. The eunuch said, Here's water. Why can't I be baptised? He ordered the chariot to stop. They both went down to the water, and Philip baptised him on the spot. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of God suddenly took Philip off, and that was the last the eunuch saw of him. But he didn't mind. He had what he'd come for, and went on down the road as happy as he could be. Philip showed up in Azotus and continued north, preaching the message in all the villages along that route until he arrived at Caesarea. Reading from Luke 9, um, Jesus in his glory. About eight days after saying this, he climbed the mountain to pray, taking Peter, John and James the monk. While he was in prayer, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became blind in white. At once, two men were there talking with him. They turned out to be Moses and Elijah, and what a glorious appearance they made. They talked over his exodus, the one Jesus was about to complete in Jerusalem. Well, Peter and those with him, meanwhile, Peter and those with him were slumped over in sleep. When they came to, rubbing their eyes, they saw Jesus in his glory and the two men standing with him. When Moses and Elijah had left, Peter said to Jesus, Master, this is a great moment. Let's build three memorials. One for you, one for Moses, and one for late Elijah. He blurted this out without thinking. While he was babbling on like this, a light radiant cloud enveloped them. As they found themselves buried in the cloud, they became deeply aware of God. Then there was a voice out of the cloud. This is my son, the chosen. Listen to him. When the sound of the voice died away, they saw Jesus there alone. They were speechless. And they continued speechless. And, not, and said not one thing to anyone during those days of what they had seen. This week we've been uh, emptying one of the circuit churches uh, ready for a sale of that church. And it's a strange experience, you know. We emptied loads and loads of contents into a large skip out on the driveway. And um, some of those things were just sheer rubbish, things that people... Uh, we're very happy to get rid of and others held such precious memories for people it's amazing isn't it you go through the material i'm sure some of you have done it in your houses you go through material and you realize that each little bit just provokes a memory for you provokes something important and and some stuff we want to keep hold of and other stuff uh, may provoke a memory but nonetheless we're still quite happy to um, get rid of it other things perhaps we want to pass on to other people it was interesting we found things in the church that um, had come from other churches when they'd closed or had been gifts from certain people um, all sorts of different things lots of good memories lots of happy memories in there uh, all brought together uh, and all all moving on now and it's a strange thing isn't it when we move out of a church building because it feels like in some ways it's it's the end of an era and, and I guess in many ways it is it is the end of an era for that building why, why, why is that? Well, because, of course, the building is is 
a real permanent presence for us in whatever location it is, whether it be a village or a town or a city. It puts down a marker, if you like. It says, here we are. We, we're here. The people of God are in this place. Here's our real visible presence. It gives people a real sense of belonging somewhere, a place that they can call their own. And all of us desire that that place that we can feel that we belong. And the church can be very much that. The church building itself can be very much that. And of course, it can also be a place where we can um, really witness our mission to the community around us. We can use the building in such a way that it allows us to do things that reach out to the community. We can invite them in. We can invite them to, uh, whether it be a toddler group or whether it be um, uh, a, a lunch club. Um, in, in latter days, maybe it, it would be um, something like a harvest festival. Um, we can invite them on a Sunday to come and join worship with us. Maybe we invite them midweek to do it. And of course, we can use those buildings for the benefit of the, the wider community as well. Um, many church buildings are used these days by other parts of the community that may have a connection with the church, may have no connection with the church whatsoever, but are simply able to use that community space and use it for the benefit of others in the community. So having that physical presence, that real location where we can say, this is us, this is where we are, the people of God in this place, can be really important. But you know, one of the things that struck me when we were doing this was that it can also be really limiting. What do I mean by that? Well, you know, one of the reasons we crave buildings, one of the reasons we want homes and, and places um, that we can call our own is because of our desire for a sense of safety. And that's what our church buildings can give us sometimes, this idea of safety. We can be within the building. We can go in there, we can close the doors and we can be ourselves. We can worship God. We can do whatever we want. We can talk to one another. We can pray with one another. But we do it sometimes at the risk of closing out those people who are outside. We go in, we close the doors, we have big imposing. This is this is a, an old Victorian church. It's a big imposing red brick building that frankly scares some people. And people will say, I don't know what goes on in there. I don't want to come anywhere near there. And we can all too quickly retreat into our own little enclave. Um, and people go, oh yeah, that's the church, but we don't really know what goes on in there. They they meet there, maybe maybe they just think we they meet there every Sunday. Um, and maybe in some cases that is what we do. We only meet there on a Sunday, certainly with the one that we're working through at the moment, that had become the case. And in fact, over the last two years, we've not met there at all. Um, it's been used by a community group uh, one night a week. Other than that, we've not really used it at all. So there is a real danger that that, that building closes us off for the com from the community rather than opens us up to the community. And it seems to me that the other danger that comes with it is that we can um, inadvertently become historian uh, or, or custodians, sorry, rather than historians, we can become custodians of something um, which really can become a bit of a, a weight around our neck. Um, we put so much effort into our buildings. We want quite rightly to make them the best that they can be, that we pour all of our effort into those buildings. But it's a challenge again, isn't it, to look at to look at a church and say, where is most of your effort going? Where is most of your financial resources going? Where is most of people's time going? I remember being in a session and somebody said to us, I want you to uh, tell me what are the five most important things in your life? And of course, people come up with my friends and my family and my faith and, and various other different things. And then they said, right, what I want you to tell me now is where do you spend most of your time and where do you spend most of your money? And, you know, it, it, it's an interesting exercise to do. And I'd encourage you all to have a go at it, because what I realised and what most of the people in that session realised is that the two things didn't match. The things that we said were really important to us were not those things actually where we spent our time, or where we spent our money. And what does that say? That says that really those things where we spend our time and where we spend our money become the most important things to us, even if it's not what we would desire them to be. And there is a danger that our churches, our church buildings become that, 
and we become custodians of something because we feel that we have to have that physical building in a location. We feel that we have to be able to offer every kind of group to the community, even if it's already out there, even if somebody else is already doing it. And so many congregations have faithfully carried on, um, literally propping up their buildings. Um, the one that we, we're, we're looking at at the moment, um, had it gone much further, it would have physically needed propping up. It, it suffered from some severe damage uh, over the over the years. Uh, that's left some some really significant structural cracking in it. Um, so our buildings can be both a blessing for us, but also they can bring us real challenges and maybe divert us from what's right. But one of the things that struck me as we were going through this process is what comes next. Because, you know, the church historically, um, we, we've been very much guided by what can we do in our building? Uh, and I think that's not unique. That's what, certainly in my experience, what most churches have done. And what can we do in our building? How do we use our building to reach people? But that got me to thinking about the early church. It got me to thinking about Jesus and about the way he did things. And it made me really start to wonder, perhaps we've got that the wrong way around. Let me try and illustrate with the story of Philip meeting the Ethiopian. So if you remember, the Ethiopian uh, administrator is in his carriage and he's going down the road and he's reading from Isaiah and uh, he passes Philip and uh, Philip says to him, I can explain that passage to you. I can tell you who that passage is talking about. And, and the uh, Ethiopian says, well, OK, so, so you know, carry on and tell me who that passage is talking about. And Philip explains to him how the passage is talking about Jesus and how Jesus is the Messiah that he's he's been reading about. And the Ethiopian says at that point in time, I want to be baptised. And Philip has got this kind of great reaction where he sort of says, what, 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 here and now? And the Ethiopian kind of goes, well, yeah, why not? Here and now. And Philip says, OK, come on then, let's go baptise you. And he goes and baptises him. Uh, Ethiopian goes on his way. We're told Philip uh, goes elsewhere. We don't really know what happens after that. Imagine how different that story would have been if Philip had said, well, great idea. I tell you what, make an appointment with me. I think on Sunday we're a bit busy, but the following Sunday or maybe two weeks time, we could probably fit you in for a baptism in the church. Um, that would be OK. The spontaneity is gone. That moment has passed when that person wants to commit their life to God and to Jesus. And yet Philip, in that moment, didn't require a building, didn't require anything really, just the river that was nearby. And he said to the man, yeah, sure, come on then, let's go and baptise you. The Ethiopian wasn't looking, he didn't say, could I come to church with you next week? Let's be honest, how many people have ever asked us that anyway? Could I come to church with you next week? The Ethiopian just said, I hear what you tell me about Jesus and I really want to know about that and I want to make that commitment that you've told me I can make through being baptised with water. Let's do it. Or remember when Jesus was transfigured and the disciples who were with him said, we want to build a tent, we want to put a tent up, we want to remember this place, we want to make this place really special. We understand that. It was an amazing event that they'd seen and they wanted to commemorate it in some way. But Jesus says to them, no, 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 you can't pin this down. This isn't about trying to fix a place here. This is part of my ministry. This is part of what's happening to me. But when he tells the disciples to go out and he says, just take what you've got. He doesn't say go off and oh, um, get some architect's drawings and, and bring up a plan and then do some fundraising for the next five, ten years and then build a church and then we'll start the work. Then we'll go and tell people the good news about me. Then we'll go and save people. Then we'll go and tell people how they can have life and life in all its fullness. Then we'll go and share with people the joy and the hope and the peace that can come from knowing me. No, he says, go, go and go and talk to people. Go and share with them. And for me, there's something in there that presents us with a real challenge about how we use our buildings, or indeed, in some cases, whether we even need a building. 
if we see the building as a bit of a fortress for us, as a bit of a safe place where we can be protected from everything that's going on in the world, where we can be in our own little bubble. Hey, we've talked lots about bubbles in the last two years, haven't you? About keeping us safe in our little bubbles. If, if we see the church building as our little bubble that keeps us safe from everything that's outside and stops us being polluted by that, then it seems to me that we've got it very wrong. But if we see the building as somewhere as a base to reach out to people, as a place where we can come together and we can worship and then we can go out and share that love and that joy with other people, then maybe it's worth us having a building. But it's been interesting when we've not used our building for the last couple of years. Has it stopped us doing stuff? Um, we've got used to another building. We've done some things in that other building, including meeting and worshipping on a Sunday. But what have we done that perhaps we wouldn't have done in the past? Well, we meet in somebody's house once or twice a month and we do a study as a small group. That class group, if you like, as Wesley would have had, or the original idea that the disciples and the, and the early Christians had of meeting in one another's houses. And you know, we gain so much from that, probably far more than we gain from being in a big corporate act of worship where people might feel afraid to speak to one another, might feel afraid to raise the questions that they've got, might feel afraid to say, I don't understand that. I, I'm really struggling with this at the moment. Can you help me? Can you, can I share with you just how I feel at the moment? We've been able to go into the local school once a, once a week. We go in, we see them, um, we, we run a club for the, for the children, they come and meet us, but where they feel safe. We don't say, come to this big, scary red brick building that you don't know. We say, we'd love to come to you. We'd love to come to your school. We'd love to come to the place that you are at every day. And we'd love to share with you and share something of God's love with you. We've met children and their families in the park for a picnic. We've had them doing treasure hunts around the park, finding different things. And we share together and we had the opportunity on what was fortunately a lovely sunny day to sit and talk to parents, to sit and talk to dads who'd come with their children who would never have set foot in the building of the church. Yet we're happy to sit and have 15, 20 minute conversations with us about their life, about their children, about the challenges that they had, about their history. We've been to the local pub. We've competed against quiz teams in the local pub, badly, I have to say. But with the church name being up there, up the front, unashamedly saying, yeah, this is us as your local church, coming to you, sharing in this fun every evening that you have. We might not win, but we just want to share with you. We just want to be part of your community. We've been to the same pub and we've sung carols with them even to the point where a group of people who'd come for a party were happy for us to switch off the music and sing carols instead of the songs that were coming through the PA at them. We could have done all of those things if we'd had a building, but would we have? I suspect not. I suspect not because we'd have felt safe where we were. We'd have gone down the same path as we'd always gone down. We'd have invited people to come to our carol service. We'd have invited people maybe to come to our harvest festival. We'd have put coffee mornings on. We'd have done all of those kind of things. But we wouldn't have been meeting people where they are. And that's what Jesus did. Jesus never said to somebody, come and meet me. Not least because where were they going to meet him? He said to Zacchaeus, come down out of the tree, I'm coming to your house for tea. He went to Matthew the tax collector's house for dinner. He went to the house of Mary and Martha. Jesus met people where they were. The woman at the well. And that's a challenge that we have as Christians today. People don't know. People outside of church, outside of Christianity, don't know what happens in a church. It's an irrelevance to them what goes on in our buildings. The buildings probably mean absolutely nothing to them. 
but we still have a gospel to share. We still have a good news to share with people. And the challenge we have is how we move out from where we are, how we are unafraid and unashamed to move out, to go and to share that good news, to be part of the community, to be going to other people, to be taking the good news rather than seeking to bring people into us. Because if we do that, if we meet people where they are, if we have those conversations, if we show them, if you like, that we're normal, one of the things that people generally are quite surprised by, if we show them that we're normal, that we've got the same challenges as they have, that we have the same fears, we have the same doubts, we have the same highs and lows as they do, we have the same uh, life choices as, as they do. But through all of that, we do so in the power of the Holy Spirit and we do so with the assurance of God's love for us as shown in Jesus Christ. That's when they will see something in us that says, I want to be a part of that. I too want what you've got. And they won't be saying, can I come to your building? What they'll be saying is, can I share with you in what you have? Can I become a follower of that Jesus Christ that you talk about? And our answer at that point will, point will be a glorious yes and hallelujah, of course you can. And at that point, we need to not be afraid to take the initiative there and then. And if we haven't got a building, so much the better in some ways, because we can say to them, yep, let's pray that prayer with you now. Let's make that choice with you now. You don't have to make an appointment. God's got no appointment book. Jesus has got no diary. And nor should we have. We should be taking the opportunity to see people where they are, to meet people where they are, to share the good news with them and to allow them the opportunity to respond and to be ready to welcome them with open arms and with the love that God shows us. So whether you're sat there with a building or not, and obviously this morning, if you're watching this, if you're watching it this morning or later, then uh, clearly you're not sat in a church. Hey, it, you know, we've got plenty of people here who uh, either can't get to church, uh, to a church building or don't want to go to a church building. Um, for whatever reason, this is perfect proof that we don't need the buildings to be the people of God, but we do need to be true to that calling to go, to go and make disciples of all people everywhere and to do so knowing that Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit is with us to the very end of the age. Amen. And so let's pray as we come before God with our intercessions. Gracious God, whose spirit helps us in our weakness and guides us in our prayers, we pray for the church and for the world in the name of Jesus Christ. Renew the life and faith of the church, strengthen our witness and make us one in Christ. Grant that we and all who confess that Christ is Lord may be faithful in your service and filled with the Spirit that the world may be turned to you. Guide the nations in the ways of justice, liberty and peace and help them to seek the unity and welfare of all people. Give to all in authority wisdom to know and strength to do what is right. Comfort those in sorrow, heal the sick in body or in mind and deliver the oppressed. Grant us compassion for all who suffer and help us so to carry one another's burdens that we may fulfill the law of Christ. And we think especially today, Lord, of the people affected by the undersea volcano that has caused such devastation to Tonga. We think of the uncertainty that many of them face, of that desperate search maybe for family members and friends. We think of those people who are going to have to rebuild their lives. But we know that all over the world there are people having to do just that, to rebuild their lives, maybe because of wars or because of uh, disagreements with other people, or because of climate change causing e ecological disasters that affect them. We know there are many people seeking new homes, people who travel from where they were born, from other countries, travel across the world, take great risks, 
simply to try and find a better life or to find somewhere where they're not so persecuted. It's easy for us to criticise them, Lord, and yet which of us would not do the same in their circumstances? Help us to be compassionate. Help us not to judge. Help us to be your hands as we reach out to those in need. And in a moment of quiet, we bring before you anyone known individually to us. Lord, accept these our prayers. Receive our thanks and praise for all who have served you faithfully here on earth, and especially those who have revealed to us your grace in Christ. May we and all your people share the life and joy of your kingdom, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Lord, as we have joined in fellowship today, so although we may each go our separate way and do our own separate things in the week ahead, so we go forward as your body, as your people, adopted sons and daughters of you. Help us always to remember that we do not travel alone, but we travel with you and in the power of your Holy Spirit. That when you called us to go and make disciples of people always, that you left us with the power to do so. Help us to use that wisely as we go forward, that we may share your love and your peace with all that we meet, and know that we do so in and through the power of God the Father, Son and Holy Spirit, now and forevermore.